morning. Welcome. Thank you for coming out on this hot and tropical day. And Happy New Year. So, uh, obviously, today is New Year's. It's also my dad's birthday. My dad's here. Happy birthday. It is a, uh, a day of new beginnings. So, we want to talk about New Year's this morning. So, the New Year's has come. In fact, it seems to come qu even quicker each and every year. Every year around the world, people celebrate New Year. While many Western cultures celebrate on January 1st, the people in China celebrate in January and February. Israel celebrates in September, October, and many other countries celebrate in spring each year. I've seen people in Germany shoot off fireworks uh, at the first of the year, and I've seen people in China take a whole month off to celebrate. All of these cultures are unique, and yet they all celebrate the beginning of a new year. Celebrating is not a novel idea for our modern world. In fact, we've been doing it for over 4,000 years. The first record goes back to Mesopotamia where they would celebrate spring and the start of the new year of agriculture. They feasted for 12 days, sacrificing and praying to their guard Marduk to bless them with food. Later, Julius Caesar would begin the calendar year in his Julius calendar with the month of January. But regardless of whether they used agrarian, solar, or lunar calendars, every culture celebrated New Year's. So it got me thinking as to why. Why is it that people celebrate the beginning of something so monotonous as the start of a new calendar? What makes it special? Isn't it just another day? However, if we look at the human psyche, there's something fundamental about the chance to start over. There's a perceived hope in putting behind a year and starting afresh. There's excitement at the opportunity, the chance to make better decisions, to eat more salads and not as many desserts, to stay calm instead of yelling, to go to the gym or to volunteer more. But regardless, it's the one time of year where most people will actually reflect and be self-critical, trying to make adjustments to their lives and to their behaviors. Something about the hope of the new year just rings true with all of humanity. So today I want to look to see what scripture has to say about the new year. So if you have your Bible or your, your Bible app, you can turn with me to Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 8. It's also in the slides. <clears throat> I'm going to read what Moses has written. This is the Lord talking to Moses. Set aside the month of Abib, and observe the Passover to the Lord your God, because the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night in the month of Aviv. Sacrifice to the Lord your God a Passover animal from the herd or a flock in the place where the Lord chooses his name to dwell. Do not eat leavened bread with it. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread with it, the bread of hardship because you left the land of Egypt in a hurry, so that you may remember for the rest of your life the day that you left the land of Egypt. No yeast is to be found anywhere in your territory for seven days, and none of the meat you sacrifice in the evening on the first day is to remain until morning. You are not to sacrifice the Passover animal in any of the towns the Lord your God is giving you. Sacrifice the Passover animal only at the place where the Lord your God chooses to have his name dwell. Do this in the evening as the sun sets at the same day or the same time of day that you departed from Egypt. You are to cook it and eat it in, in the place where the Lord your God chooses, and you are to return to your tents in the morning. Eat unleavened bread for six days. On the seventh day, there is to be a solemn assembly to the Lord your God. Do not do any work. And so here in verse 1, God calls the Israelites to observe the month of Aviv. So the, in the early Jewish calendar, this is March, April, later to be known as Nisan after the Babylonian exile. And of this, Yahweh says in 
Exodus, Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this shall be the beginning of months for you. It shall be the first month of the year for you. And so Aviv 1 began the religious calendar for the Israelites. And Yahweh declared that Passover was the beginning of their year. So real quickly, Passover is this seven-day celebration of their deliverance from Egypt. So if you remember the story from Genesis and Exodus, Joseph gets sold into slavery and goes into uh, Egypt. But God uses it for his own purposes to save Israel and his sons. And so they go to Goshen in er, in Egypt, and they begin to build a family. And the Egyptians become afraid because the Israelites are many. And so they put them into slavery. Okay? So celebrating Passover is, is calling, is celebrating the calling of Moses. When Moses comes in and God brings the plagues against Egypt so that his people are set free. So celebrating Passover from that point was a reminder to the Israelites of that freedom from Egypt. That it was represented by their release from captivity. Not only has the Israelites been chosen by Yahweh, but they were now rescued by him. They were his own. Interestingly enough, if we go to the book of Nehemiah chapter 2, Nehemiah is also released in the month of Nisan in Aviv to return to Jerusalem to rebuild Jerusalem. And so in this beginning of the year, Yahweh rescues the Jews not only from Egypt from but from Babylon and so there's this echoing of a deliverance at the start of a new year later on the Jews would establish the day of the day of atonement that, that Yahweh had given them what we know as Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur as the start of their civil calendar so now they have two new years they have a religious first of the year and they have a civil new first of the year and so let's look at the day of atonement real quick Uh, You can turn with me to Leviticus 16. We're going to be verse 29. This is to be a permanent statute for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you are to practice self-denial and do no work. Both the native and the alien who reside among you, atonement will be made for you on this day to cleanse you. And you will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Now, notice it doesn't say that you'll be uh, forgiven, but you'll be clean. It is a Sabbath of complete rest for you, and you must practice self-denial. It is a permanent statute. The priest who is anointed and ordained to serve as high priest in the place of his father will make atonement. He will put on the linen garments, the holy garments, and make atonement for the most holy place. He will make atonement for the tent of meeting and the altar. And will make atonement for the priests and all the people of the assembly. This is to be a permanent statute for you to make atonement for the Israelites once a year because of all their sins. And this was done as the Lord commanded Moses. So I want you to, I want you to notice a few things here. So we now have two, year, two New Years in the Israelite calendar. There's the religious and the civil New Year. And I want to look at the symbolism of them both. All right? So in the Passover, we have the deliverance, the freedom. Right? It was Yahweh that proved more powerful than the Egyptian gods. He's the one that delivered Israel. And in the atonement, we have blood of a sin offering from a bull or a goat. That, but that did not absolve the Israelites of their sin. It merely covered it. It allowed Yahweh to dwell in their presence for another year. So what were the Israelites celebrating in their new year? They were celebrating, one, that Yahweh has proven himself as the most high God. Two, that they had been delivered from captivity by Yahweh. Three, that their sin was covered for another year. And four, because of that, Yahweh's continued blessing would be upon them because his presence would continue to to dwell with them. And so it was good for the Israelites to celebrate the new year, but ultimately, Israel still had a sin problem. So I know some of you know who Jordan Peterson is. Uh, I follow him, Anthony, and I were actually both, I think Jamie went too. We were both at uh, seeing him live not too long ago, and 
he had said something. I, I, I want you guys to just think about this statement. He's doing an, a series on Exodus with a bunch of uh, theologians right now. But in reflecting on it, he said this. Destroying slavery and tyranny leave you in the desert, not in the promised land. So even though Israel was freed from captivity, they weren't yet in the promised land. They still had work to do. Freedom from captivity does not equal the promised land. Just like the Hebrews, a new year offers liberation from the old, a chance to be cleansed from our sins of the past year. The opportunity of the new is worthy of celebration. However, we must remember that there's still work for us to do. Just like the Israelites in the desert, we are not yet in the promised land. See, the new year offered the Israelites a chance to reset themselves once a year in relation to God. It allowed them to continue to dwell in God's presence, enjoying his blessing and protection. But we, as the church, have an even better way to enjoy God's presence. So turn me with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 22. I'm going to read in verse 7. Then the day of unleavened bread came when the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. Listen, he said to them, when you've entered the city, a man carrying a water jug will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. Tell the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where's the guest room where I can eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished room upstairs. Make the preparations there. So they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup. And after giving thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And so Jesus desires to celebrate the new year also. To celebrate it with his disciples. And as he celebrates his Passover, he knows what's coming next. He willingly goes to his death to end the sin problem. And so we saw with the Israelites that they had these two New Year days, right? They had Passover and they had the atonement. But in Jesus, Passover and atonement come together. And so we mirror both the Passover and the Day of Atonement because we've been set free from captivity to sin and we've been cleansed from it. The atonement of the blood of Jesus is not a covering that needs to be renewed. There's no longer a need for the Day of Atonement because Jesus was the unblemished Lamb of God. As God-man, he lived a life that we can never live and substituted himself in our place to die for our sin that we could never atone for on our own. The best that the Israelites could hope for was to being tolerated by Yahweh God for another year because their sin was only temporary, temporarily covered by blood. We, as the church, do not need a yearly sacrifice anymore to enjoy God's blessing. Jesus' blood renews us daily even moment by moment, and never needs to be reapplied. After his ascension, the church receives the Holy Spirit, who will dwell in every believer. And the prophet Joel writes, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on my male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. We just finished celebrating the incarnation, Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. And yet Jesus said to his disciples that it was better that he go away because then the Spirit would come. 
In John 16, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. And so we have the Spirit. And so what should we, as believers, as followers of Christ, what should we be celebrating? Well, we can continue celebrating that Yahweh has proven himself over and over again as the Most High God. We can celebrate that we've been delivered from captivity to sin, that we've been covered by Jesus' blood in a complete and final covering, and that Yahweh continues to bless us through his spirit. See, unlike the Israelites, we don't have to wait for an annual reset. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us thanks to the atonement of Jesus. And because of that, we get to start each day anew. Every morning we should wake up should be the start of a New Year's celebration. The kingdom of God on earth has been initiated, but it has not been completed. We are led by the Spirit to point the world to Jesus Why we look forward to that day when everything becomes new. And so that's what I want to do right now. Let's look forward to what that day will look at. Turn with me, if you can, to Revelation 21. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of the heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard in a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. He also said, Write these words because they are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. The one who conquers will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. And so our work isn't done. We have something to look forward to. Our sanctification doesn't end until we've been glorified. So I'm going to talk just for a minute about sanctification and glorification. Sanctification is the process of being made holy. It's a lifelong process that we engage in as we follow the Holy Spirit, as we're made to be more and more like Christ. And it's not finished until we're in glory. Glorification is the putting off of our old bodies and bringing on the new uncorrupted flesh, just like Jesus did when he was uh, resurrected. There will be no more weaknesses in his body. There will be no more pain. Today, the way we are now, we mourn our sin from the day before, and we start afresh each new day, looking to draw closer in step with the Spirit. But in the new kingdom, it will be a worldwide Eden without sin. So this is what the Christian has to look forward to, a perfect new world without sin, where we will rule and reign with Christ in a global Eden-like setting. There will no longer be a need for celebration of renewal. Instead, all will be perfect. We will walk with Jesus and dwell with him in his presence forever. That is what heaven will be. But as I said, just like the Israelites, we're not in the promised land yet. There's still work for us to do. So how can we apply this lesson to our lives? It's good for us to celebrate a new year and to reflect on how we can improve just as our worldly friends do. Much like the Israelites in the desert, Jesus has set us free from captivity. But there's still more work for us to do before we enter the promised land. We are called to a mission higher than ourselves. We have been called to work and steward creation, to fill the earth with people who love God, and to follow the Holy Spirit in building the kingdom of God on earth. And so these are the kind of questions we need to be asking, not just today, but every day of the year. How can I show God's love to someone today? How can I encourage a brother or sister in Christ today? How can I draw closer to the Holy Spirit? How can I disciple a person? 
How can I humble myself enough to ask for help? You see, self-reflection is good for all humans, but it's too easy for us to become caught up in our own feelings and insecurities. God has called his followers outward to serve others. That is what the church should be. Not an organization that's focused on forcing others to follow God's rules, but a people who will love others into wanting to know Jesus. We can and must be self-critical every day because we do not hope in our own good works. The difference for Christians is that we do not hope for temporal things. Instead, all of our hope is in the person of Jesus. By his blood, we are renewed and made righteous today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Let us pray. God, we come before you today and just ask for your blessing on a new year. That you would lead us in your will. That you would guide us. That your spirit would go before us and call us. And give us the boldness and strength to follow. God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.